then uh, just this is sort of a breakout of drilling and depletion activity. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail on this, but these are sort of subsets of the larger numbers that I had reported earlier. Um, in, in, the, in the 20, basically 10 year time frame out to 2022, uh, we expect 4,800 uh, new wells to be predicted, but again, the range there is on the low side of 34, 3,500, up to maybe uh, close to 6,000. Uh, and, and again, that assumes that we don't see some significant uh, jump in production activity that comes to us in a somewhat unexpected fashion. We expect gas production to be about uh, 244 billion cubic feet a year, and oil production to, uh, in the study area to be about 112 million barrels. And then these are the, the, the county level uh, breakouts of the counties, what we call the adjacent counties. So, uh, you know, the numbers are, are relatively small compared to the producing counties. We haven't broken out the producing counties yet, but, uh, uh, but for, the, for the adjacent counties, you know, we're seeing it in 2012 about $6.9 million in economic output, supporting really only, only 28 full-time jobs. Uh, by 2022, that number goes to $10.5 million in economic output, supporting uh, close to 40 full-time jobs. And, and uh, we've got all of the six counties uh, outlined here. I'm not going to necessarily go into the detail of all that, but there's Coke County in 2012, Coke County in 2022, Coleman County, and these are in uh, executive, the executive summary uh, handouts that we have for you today as well. Uh, this presentation, uh, I'm happy to send it to any of you uh, if you'd like a copy of it. Uh, West Texas Energy Consortium will make it available to you as well, but if you'd like a copy of the presentation, just let me know and we'll get one out to you. In Ramos County, Taylor County, and Tom Green. Uh, I'm going to shift gears just a little bit and talk about what some of the implications of shale oil and gas are having on the U.S. and really the world market in general. And one of the, the, the things that's interesting is in the past it's been very hard to predict natural gas prices. Uh, I think it'll continue to be hard to predict oil prices. I don't even want to go there. But with natural gas, we, we feel a little bit better about making some predictions that have been tough to make in the past. This is from 2007 where the EIA attempted to uh, forecast natural gas prices out into say 20, 2030 uh, and, uh, and, and didn't, didn't really do a very good job but this was before really the full impact of shale oil and gas, shale gas in particular, it made its impact. Uh, one of the things that I always like to, to make fun of with other people's forecasts when I can is whenever you see really ugly jagged data like this and then we get the forecast and things smooth out and realize um, unfortunately the world doesn't tend to work like that and this is what actually happened to natural gas prices. Uh, in 2012, last year, they uh, bottomed out at around two dollars per thousand cubic feet, which is, is a very, very low price for natural gas. More recently, though, they have stabilized, and because of the huge potential supplies, not only in the U.S. but in other parts of the world, we think that we're going to see a long-term natural gas price range of between four to seven dollars per thousand cubic feet, and very possibly in a tighter range between five and six dollars per thousand cubic feet, and that contrasts with the highly volatile prices we saw from 2000 to 2012 when the prices ranged from $2 per thousand cubic feet to $14 per thousand cubic feet. When they're that volatile, it makes it very difficult for companies to plan to use electricity for power generation, for feedstock for manufacturing facilities, uh, converting local fleets to, to, to uh, use natural gas or even export. But because of the huge supplies online now, we think that a lot of these applications will become feasible because the price of natural gas will be much more predictable than it has been in the, fa in the past. And that's one of the reasons a lot of people uh, are struggling uh, with the, the, the issue of export because they're sort of looking backwards and seeing how volatile natural gas prices had been in the past. We just don't think that's going to be the case going forward with or without export. Uh, one of the reasons oil ultimately became a global market the way it is now is because of the ability to ship it pretty much anywhere with these super tankers. And what we're starting to see is a lot more of these LNG tankers getting built and more export permits being approved here in the U.S. So we think that will tend to stabilize natural gas prices, not only in the U.S., but worldwide. Right now, there's a huge differential in what, company, uh, what countries pay for natural gas. As I mentioned, in the U.S., we pay about $350 to $4 per thousand cubic feet. Now, uh, in Europe, they pay $12. In Japan, they pay $17. So there's, there's there opportunities for arbitrage, and, and they will be exploited, and, and it's these LNG tankers that are going to make some of that possible. So again, we, we think that with regard to the issue on LNG export, 
Uh, we, we think that's going to be a net benefit to the U.S. economy, uh, that uh, prices worldwide will, will become more stable and, and there will be less uh, differential. And, and, and we think it will uh, stabilize in a 4 to $7 range for, for the foreseeable future, at, at least a decade or two. One of the other points I wanted to make, and this is going to uh, follow up from Ken's comments about uh, needing to, to work together and uh, uh, form coalitions with regional approaches. One of the things we tend to forget is that Texas used to be a rural state by and large. This is a sort of a distribution of some selected counties in 1890, which includes Bear County, where San Antonio is. As you can see, even back then, both Bear County, Travis County, didn't have that many more people than some of the other counties in the state. There just wasn't that huge a discrepancy between populations across the state the way there is now. If we look uh, to uh, the 2010 census, we can see that Bear County and Travis County, for example, have much, much larger populations in the rural areas. In fact, uh, from the time period between 2000 and 2010, according to the census, there were 79 counties in Texas that lost population overall. Uh, and, and when that happens, not only do House seats get reapportioned, but so do Senate seats. In the U.S., every state always keeps their two senators. Well, in, in parts of West and South Texas, they've actually, uh, the districts have changed because the population losses have occurred and those, that, those seats, representative, uh, those House seats and Senate seats have gone in large measure to the larger cities. So Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, Houston, San Antonio have been the beneficiaries of the population shifts in Texas that occur. The other point I want to make is that uh, while I've been in San Antonio for a couple of years now, I still regularly get up to uh, the Dallas Fort Worth area. And people will ask me about the research I'm working on, and I tell them that I'm working on the, uh, a lot of it is on the Eagle for Shale, for example. And they say, oh, what's that? So even in other parts of the state, uh, people are largely unfamiliar with a lot of what's going on out in South and West Texas in terms of, of the uh, uh, shale oil and gas production. And so, and they've got their own issues with regard to things like roads. Uh, so uh, it's really going to be important for South and West Texas to work together uh, to form regional approaches to make, to take their case to Austin uh, for issues like roads and other types of infrastructure. Broad, uh, broadband infrastructure, much like the rural electrification program, uh, uh, helped uh, rural parts of Texas. I think the similar initiatives will, will have to be uh, taken forward uh, in a regional approach, regional fashion. And toward that end, uh, what we're urging communities uh, that are being affected by shale oil and gas impacts are to uh, uh, engage in long-term, medium and long-term planning, uh, putting together uh, revenue and investment strategies, uh, getting citizens involved, uh, making use of institution, uh, strong institutional management, fiscal discipline, development of a skilled workforce, again, uh, because we want those jobs to be filled by folks who live and work here. Uh, and, uh, and just in general, uh, ongoing education, again, we're trying to learn from the experience in other shale plays to see uh, what's worked well and, and maybe what hasn't worked so well. Opportunities to diversify are going to be critical. We, we saw what happened to Houston. Uh, in, in the early 80s when the price of oil collapsed. We want to uh, try to encourage communities to diversify. West Texas uh, knows very well uh, how the price of oil can change uh, the landscape, the economic landscape. So diversification to the extent that uh, we can do that is going to be very important. Uh, and using tools like uh, uh, rediscovering the community's history, uh, using uh, mixed-use development to, to revitalize downtown areas, I mentioned forging linkages and alliances, best practices for other shale plays and certainly working with elected representatives across the board. And ultimately, communities in South Texas, in terms of economic development, we used to uh, define economic development pretty much in terms of job growth. Uh, we can mention uh, uh, chasing smokestacks. Well, there are really five key components of economic development in, in more modern definitions. One is job growth, but another is uh, quality of life, environmental stewardship, development of a skilled workforce, and development of high-quality infrastructure. And those are the types of things that will enable communities to be sustainable in the long term and to attract other types of industries so that uh, we're not hopefully so dependent on oil and gas that we're subject to, to, the, to the cyclical nature of the industry. And these are just some examples of uh, some of that infrastructure. And with that, I thank you for your attention and the opportunity to speak here. Thank you.